to see everyone this morning. We've got a few that are out on vacation this week. So you see a couple of gaps in our seats. Our pastor and his wife are out as well. I talked to him last night. He said, tell, tell everybody hi. He's praying for us. I think they're having a really good time. Glad to have Pastor Steve available to speak to us a little bit later in the service. We're, we're blessed to have many good leaders in this church. People are going to just step up when we need to. That's a, a very good thing. Uh, you know, I think many of you know that last weekend we had a uh, walk to Emmaus weekend that several of our team members worked on, and and uh, it must have been a really close knit group because 20 of them got COVID. <laughs> so we have some missing today for that reason. So we want to keep those those families in our in our prayers. Uh, you know, you, you just never know, right? You just never know. Why don't we start with a chorus this morning? Why don't you stand as we sing? Father God, we do recognize your greatness. I know some would think that we can only sing a song like that on the good days because of the happiness and the joy and the prayers answered and the strength gained and the wisdom learned. But Father, we need to sing those same exact words on the difficult days as well. 
and on the impossible days. For Father, you are great, you are strong, you're a mighty tower, you're the great healer, you're the great comforter, you're the great leader. And Father, all of us in different stages of our life, we all need that same great entity as a part of our life. So Father, for those who are celebrating today, you're a great God and greatly to be praised. For those who are hurting today, you are a great God and greatly to be praised. Help us to remember that you were there for us in all circumstances. And help us to in turn be there for the people around us. That's my prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat. Had a good reports from our Henderson week weekend work last week. And I hear good things, COVID aside, I hear really good things from the walk to Emmaus. Anybody else have any praises? Good things happen this week they'd like to share. Jane's mother is in heaven. And that's a celebration with equal with the tears she's been sharing already this morning. Her services are Tuesday. A visitation, and we'll give you the information, but it's all at Alexander uh, Chapel out at, at the funeral, at the grave, graveside. So uh, we were blessed to be able to spend the evening last night with Jane and Jerry and talk through all the, the happiness of 90 plus years of living for the Lord, what it's, what it's like. And as I spoke this morning to Steve and his wife, you know, leaving for, for heaven is not the worst thing. It's the best thing. And so many of us forget that. So we're celebrating with you, Jane, even in your pain. Even in your pain. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Thank God that my helpmate uh, is fine now and uh, that she had an overnight stay in the hospital, but I praise God that she's fine today. Amen. Amen. Anyone else have something they'd like to share in terms of praise today? I have, I have one. Please. continues to amaze his doctors and everyone else. Thank you for the continued prayers. They are working. He is completely off sedation and they are working to get him off the vent. He is communicating with his head nods and hand squeezes and trying hard to talk. I'm getting or he's getting better at reading lips. Um, they started the feeding tube yesterday so he is getting nutrition. He, he's not impressed. He can't have coffee. And, um, let's see, and then um, it just says, today we stand in prayer for his pain and his breathing to improve so he can get off the vent. It's a dentist has told <clears throat> daily how many people are praying for him and care for him and love him. And what a miracle true is. he truly is. God, not only. God's got big things for him. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. I have a few in my family that I'll share. You know, you've been praying with me for my grandson, Leland, who's having struggles learning at three years old how to eat. And I'm not telling you that he's eating better, but he's drinking his boost better. He's no longer fighting it for two hours at a time for a little six ounce bottle, 15 minutes. So things are getting better because the family has a little bit more time to just have some normalcy. We pray, continue to pray that the therapist working with him will teach him that it's okay. So he can start to eat and take care of his own body. And then uh, about every other Sunday, you get to see my kids sit with me over here. Jared, my son-in-law, also works at Old National Bank with me, and he's had a really, really hard row. Uh, one of the gentlemen who was, who was killed was close enough friends with Jared that they have vacationed together before. And it's just, it's just been really difficult. So uh, we have many, many difficult days ahead in relationship to that to that situation, but I just wanted to share with you that one of our own, Jaron, uh, needs your prayers as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer again. Father God, we just thank you that, that you truly are great. Father, we thank you that, that you're, you are steadfast. You're always in the same place, which is right where we need you. 
And Father, we are not as steadfast. We don't stay in the same place. We move, we flit and flutter. What we really need to do is just to be still and know that you are God. And we need to cast our cares upon you because we know you care for us. So Father, in the celebrations, we give you thanks and praise. In the heartbreak, we recognize that you are God. And we give you thanks and praise. And Father, we ask that we learn through our life's experiences that you can be trusted, that you can be depended upon, and that you are always there so that when we do hurt, we don't have a hard time finding you because we're already right there in a relationship with you. Thank you for this church, for how it ministers to one another, how we care for each other, how we truly are a family. Father, at the beginning of the service this morning, I thought about welcoming the visitors, but then I remembered they're not visitors. They're just family members I haven't met yet. And I'm thankful to be a part of a church that feels that way. Be with our pastor. Renew him physically and, and spiritually as he vacations this week. Bring him back to us full of your message for what we need to hear. Be with Stephen. He speaks to us this morning. And let your word come through in all that we say and do. And we will give you the praise for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Boys and girls, won't you head to Children's Church now? Would that be okay? We're so glad to have so many kiddos here. So glad to have volunteers to help take care of them. Thank you. All right, and you know, we sang a couple of newer songs. By new, I mean less than 100 years old. So now we're, let's sing a song that's more than 100 years old, right? Uh, it connects us to the great hymnody of the past.
Oh, I'm pleased to be able to share with you today and to tell you about the old, old story, but I want to talk about your story too. I'm thankful to be a part of a church and to have a pastor like Pastor Greg who shares with us, number one, who believes in the authority of God's Word and who believes that the scriptures of the Old and New Testament are sufficient for the guiding of our lives. So I just want to get that out of the way right now. And what a marvelous job he did over those seven weeks of Lent in sharing with us those seven last statements, if you will, or words of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And uh, I have nothing but thanksgiving in my heart for, uh, for pastors like Greg that have uh, been so faithful to the Word. I want to talk to you today in a roundabout way uh, uh, about um, walk to Emmaus. <laughs> I have made a walk to Emmaus, that's, uh, uh, but that's not what I'm talking about today. I heartily recommend it. Walk to Emmaus is not for, you know, it's not for people who are unchurched or who do not know Christ. That's not what Emmaus is for. The walk to Emmaus is for church people. Believe me when I say that. Now, have some people come to a closer relationship with God through the walk to Mass? Absolutely. Absolutely. But that is not the purpose of it. The purpose is that of it is for church people to get a better understanding of where they fit into God's plan and how they should be conducting their lives. So, anyway, that being said, let me tell you a story. At bedtime, uh, when our daughter Carrie was just a little girl, uh, al almost every night uh, we would read to her a, a story from Uncle Arthur's uh, Bible stories. H have, you ev have you ever attempted to read a story for a child and skip over some of the parts? That doesn't work, does it? Does not work. Trying to pass off a Reader's Digest version to a child absolutely is fruitless. It just won't work for you. You think you're going to save yourself some time, but it never works out like that. I mean, you may be so tired, and I've been there. <laughs> it's been a long time ago, but I've been there. I, you know, trouble at work just tired and, 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 and you're either sitting on the bed or maybe laying on the bed and, 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 you, and, and you get the book out and what story do you want read? Well, they'll point that out to you and, and you just can't skip over parts. It's got to be the whole story. She knows it by heart. He knows it by heart. Don't skip over it. You're just, you're, you're just going to have to put more time in, I'm telling you. But even while we're insisting that those stories are so well known to her and it won't hurt to skip over some of it, they know better. And even while you're insisting, they're turning back. They're turning back. Get back to the beginning. Get back to the beginning, Daddy. Because they know. They know that for a story to do what a story is meant to do, it has to be the whole story. Amen. They know that stories are meant, to, uh, are, are meant to put us in a different place so that we can learn and experience things that we never would have imagined. Now, I want to share with you today that I believe that's the way it is with the Gospels. When I say the Gospels, specifically, I mean the, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but literally the whole Bible, too. 
That's the way it is with the gospel. They weren't put together by a committee of academic minds whose intention it was to set down some scholarly dissertation. No. The gospel stories are what some people call narrative theology. Narrative theology, which is just a fancy way of saying they're stories. They're stories. They're God's way of speaking to us in our hearts so that we can know more, know more fully the meaning of those things that we've already experienced and so that we can open our hearts fully to things to come and so that we can learn about the rest part of our story. Our story. Okay. Let me share it with you. From the 24th chapter of Luke's gospel, beginning in verse 35. Then the two, and those two were those two disciples who were on their way to Emmaus after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, which left them all befuddled. They're on their way to Emmaus from Jerusalem, about six miles. Then the two told what had happened to them on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. All right. While they were still talking about them, about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. But Jesus said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And then he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You're witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. God's word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, what in the world would a child do with a child, what would a child do who knew the story with what I just read? Well, my daughter Carrie, as a little girl, would have said, hey, that's not the whole story, Daddy. So if we really want to know what a story means for us, it helps to put ourselves in the in the part of the uh, in the place of the whole telling, that's what it, it requires for us. We're told earlier on in this chapter, and Pastor Greg has shared all of this with us. If, if you've been here all throughout Lent, he he shared all of this with us. He said all everything that's going on in the beginning of this chapter is taking place on the same day that the empty tomb had been discovered. Uh, so, <laughs> this was not a cheery and happy time uh, for those friends of Jesus, for those disciples and followers of, of Jesus. What, what they knew for sure was that Jesus had been killed. He had been crucified. As a result of that, they also knew that they were sad. It was confusing to them. Maybe even some anger. 
Peter was kind of impetuous, you remember? So maybe Peter was a little angry. Maybe some of the others were also. Maybe they couldn't really put their finger on what they thought or felt, and you and I have been there too many times, haven't we? And so here, two of Jesus' followers, these two disciples, they're walking along the road. They're talking about what had happened on this terribly long weekend, and especially they're trying their darndest to make sense out of this empty tomb business. Six miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Had a lot to talk about. It was probably similar to conversations that that you and I have had before as we're riding back to the funeral home after the funeral and after the graveside service for one of our loved ones. Remember that? And it was in the middle of their talking that Jesus came along and he invited himself into their walk and into their conversation. Luke says they didn't recognize him. And so Jesus asked uh, what they were talking about. (laughs) And the Bible tells us that they stopped walking uh, and they looked at him. Listen, the Bible is real life, you know. And can you imagine Jesus saying, well, what in the world's going on? Why are you all so downcast? What's going on in your life? And they stopped, and one of them said, are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know what has happened this week? Well, Jesus actually, maybe Jesus gave them one one of those things, you know. I don't know what you're talking about. He didn't say anything right then. I don't want to say that he played dumb, but he didn't say anything, and so they told him the story. And do you, th- do you think there's any possibility that Jesus knew that the beginning of the healing of pain is sometimes found in the opportunity for us to tell our story? Even if it is for the 50th time. So Jesus listened before he said anything. You ought to make a note of that. Write that down. Sometimes we ought to listen rather than just jumping in with our own conversation. Jesus listened. He listened to them telling how they had hoped in Jesus. And how those hopes had been destroyed there at Calvary. Their hopes were just done away with. They told him about the empty tomb and about their confusion about all of that stuff. And only then did Jesus speak. But wow, what he told them. What he told them. What Jesus did was to put the story of their weekend into the context of the larger story of their whole history as the Jewish people. He showed them how his suffering and how his death were inevitable, given the the thrust or uh, what the meaning of his ministry was to be. And even while he was talking with them, uh, they came into the village of Emmaus, And you'd think it was over, wouldn't you? They didn't know who this was. But they did know that something more was happening than what their eyes and ears were seeing and hearing. And they didn't want it to end because it intrigued them. So they invited him to stay with him. And he did. And later on, as they were 
communing, as they were eating. Communion means fellowship. As they were eating together, when Jesus broke the bread, it was as if a light went on in their heads. Bing! Pay attention. But then he disappeared. Then what happened? Well, if you're familiar with the scripture, this whole story became real to those two disciples. <laughs> that was the first thing that happened. And then the second thing that happened to them is they became the first two Christian joggers as they headed back to Jerusalem. They had just come from there, six miles. But because of this encounter that they'd had, the, their understanding of this story, the entirety of the story, they took off back for Jerusalem. You know why? You'll have to form your own opinion on this, but for me, I think it was because now for those two guys, the, 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 the Jesus story had now become a personal story for them. And as a result, their faith had received a new lease on life. And they had news to share with the other disciples and anyone else who would care to listen. They had something to tell. And what happened next, honest to goodness, it was, it's almost predictable. Even as when they got back to Jerusalem, they're, they're there with the other disciples. Even... While they were there, even as they told their story of Jesus, he became present to them, to all of them. And so now there were more who had a story to tell, and that's exactly what Jesus told them to do. Tell your story. Tell the story. Break the bread. Fellowship. Not just with those in our inner circle. Tell the story to other people, for crying out loud. That's why, that's why uh, General William Booth got kicked out of the Methodist Church in England. He was hanging out in the taverns. Why was General Booth hanging out in the taverns? Because <laughs> that's where people were who needed to hear the good news. Tell the story. Break the bread. Get the good news out. And that, my friends, is the story of the disciples who took a walk to a mess. We know the beginning, we know the middle, and now we know the end. But what's far more important than committing those details to memory is to let the story do what stories are meant to do and do so well for little kids. Let's let it take us into our own story. You see, stories aren't meant just to be memorized and, and kept to ourselves. No, they're meant to be experienced. Stories are meant to be experienced, and this, certain, this, certain, this one certainly is meant to be remembered and experienced. And it's also meant to be retold so that others can have that experience. I, I don't know how early in my ministry I came to the, finally came to the conclusion that, uh, that I wasn't going to save everybody in church who was there that day. That they needed to be instructed in the faith. I spent a great part of my ministry simply getting people to tell the story. Tell the story. Tell the story. It's our story to tell. It's my story to tell. It's your story to tell. It's our story to tell. I just wish everybody could understand that. You see... For far too long, for far too long, the storytelling in the church has been left to 
the few of us who have been ordained by the church to tell the story. But those of us who are ordained by the church are far outnumbered by those of you who are God-ordained to tell the story. You've got so much more influence than Pastor Greg or me or Frank. You've got so much more influence. You already have a relationship with people that they won't, they'll quit telling a joke if I walk up. But you've got entree into their life. Tell the story. Tell the story. I love to tell the story. For those who know it best seem hungry and thirsty to hear it like the rest. I love to tell the story. It did so much for me. And that's just the reason that I'm telling you right now. Tell the story. And maybe, maybe if we can just come to the conviction that our own little piece of the Jesus story is a very important piece, then maybe we will tell the story. My fervent prayer this morning, folks, is that our eyes will be opened, our ears will be opened, so that we can hear the Lord Jesus say to each of us, tell the story. Tell what I've done for you. Not to glorify you, but to let other people know that what you have, they can have. Tell the story. Let's, you and I, take a personal walk to Emmaus this morning. And commune <laughs> with Jesus. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning so very grateful for the privilege of being allowed to tell the story. I hope I've told it right. I feel like I have. But if I haven't, I know you'll clean up the details. But I pray, Lord, that it would sink deeply into the hearts and minds of everyone who is here today. And I pray, Lord, that... Um, That the, story that, uh, that the story of Jesus will be our theme, not only in glory, but right now. Hear my prayer, Lord. I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. To tell the story, twill be my theme in glory. Father, thank you that you allow us to be a part of your story, that you've kept this church alive through multiple generations, you've planted us right where you want us, you've brought us the men that we've needed to lead us to this point, and Father, we believe and hope and trust that you've brought us the next step in Russell and Denise. Lord, I just pray that you'll bless them today as they're making the difficult announcement that they'll be leaving uh, the United Methodist Church and joining us here. Father, we just pray you'll bless their family. We pray that you'll bless Greg and Teresa and help give them a remaining vacation time to be refreshed when they come back for next week. We're just so thankful to God that we can be a part of your greater story. Help us to take personally our responsibility to share our story with those around us who need to hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week.